Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's a haunting question. Good morning, everyone. Almost to noon, by the way. I love my job. First of all, you got, this is just a taste of our student ministry. Um, we have amazing students in our student ministry. Um, and it's, it's always an amazing time to spend time with them. And with part of my job, I get to hang out with you guys once in a while, uh, which isn't too shabby. I kind of like it. Um, please go with me to Acts chapter 9. Uh, we are going to, Ryan did an awesome job uh, talking about the conversion of Saul, and we're going to go a little bit further in that. Um, I have two quick uh, orders of business I need to take care of. First of all, this is pastor's safe area. That is scary up here. Okay? <laughs> this is pastor's safe zone. This is my safe zone. <laughs> Just to let you know. Man, uh, that was scary. <laughs> Second of all, it's about time for this. <laughs> Especially if you know me. Oh, that feels good. How many of you have ever been to a place that you just didn't feel like you belong? Um, or judge someone thinking they sure don't belong in this in this situation in this place. When I was in middle school in California, in Lompoc, uh, there was a, a guy named Sam in my seventh grade class, uh, and this guy was mean. Uh, the teachers didn't like him. Most of the, the students around didn't like it when he was around. He just, he was not a nice guy. Uh, and we, being in California, we have an open campus. So we would have different buildings for classrooms, the gymnasium, but we didn't have a cafeteria. We had tables, concrete tables out in this courtyard so we could enjoy a nice meal uh, for lunch outside. Um, and of course, if it rained, we were in the classrooms. But Sam would be the guy that would find something in his lunch to toss up to the top of the, of the gymnasium. And we were close enough to the coast that there were 50, yeah, maybe 100 seagulls up on top of the gym that as soon as anything got launched up there, they would all come flying, swarming. You guys have seen birds, the birds? Is it the birds or birds? Whatever. You, got, you get the idea. So we're ducking under the tables and hiding in the, in the classrooms. I mean, Sam was just not liked by many people. Um, and so sure enough, this Sunday came along. Guess who walks in the door of my church? Sam. I'm like, no, 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 no. Come on, what's he doing here? Um, and, and luckily, he sat back with his family, and, and uh, you know, I didn't really have to talk to him. Uh, being that my dad was music and youth on staff, a staff kid, I kind of felt a little obligated, but I think that first week I was able to dodge that bullet. Sure enough, he came back. I'm like, no, no, no. I see this whole thing coming. I know it. I'm going to have to be nice to him. He's going to start coming to youth group stuff. Sure enough, the next Wednesday, he's at youth group. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, now I'm feeling the obligation of a staff kid, and I'm being nice to him. And, and long story short, I didn't think that Sam belonged uh, at my church, in my youth group, having anywhere or having anything to do with this kid. But then to see God work in his life and to see the family he ended up being a good friend. Uh, they left a couple of years later. But how sad was that of me to sit there and think, man, this kid doesn't belong here. You know, he shouldn't be at church. But yet, Christ did a work in his life. Um, and I'm so glad that I wasn't, you know, the mean one and, and shut him down and, and not be nice to him. Uh, it took a while, but it was a situation where I didn't think Sam belonged but he very much belonged in the church. He very much was welcomed by Jesus Christ in his life. And as we 
go through this. I mean, I thought of many times that I walked into a situation and didn't feel like I belonged. Or like my situation with Sam, I'm the one that kind of threw up the judgment. It's was like, you don't belong here. And I, I promise there are a number of you that have felt that, maybe even recently, that you didn't quite belong. Um, or you felt that someone else didn't, didn't belong. They weren't worthy enough to come and be a part of, of what you're doing, especially anything to do with church um, or Bible study. But guess who else went through this? And this is Saul. Uh, Ryan did great building up uh, the first part of chapter 9. And we're looking at this major turnaround that Saul had. And what conversion isn't dramatic, uh, being taken from death to life, uh, that Saul got to experience Christ. Uh, being called evil and a persecutor and a murderer, uh, to then being called the chosen instrument of God. Ananias came and prayed with him. And then Saul was, he was all in. He went to go preach all among, uh, around Damascus to the point that the Jews wanted nothing to do with him and they needed to, to stop him to where he had to escape uh, over a wall in a basket out of Damascus. And eventually he makes his way back to Jerusalem, the very place in chapter 8 where he has completely caused and wreaked havoc among the Christians of Jerusalem. And now Saul's back, and he, he gets there, and he walks into this room, and there are some disciples, and they are like, uh, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. Take a look at, at 9, verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Uh, they were afraid. It, that word is, is to even flee, to get out of there. They were a little freaked out that Saul, the persecutor, walks into this room claiming to be a Christian, and they're like, no way. No, 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 no. You, you don't belong here. <clears throat> there is, we want nothing to do with you. Uh, and can you imagine the, the frustration that Saul is experiencing? If it was me, I mean, I don't know. Would I have given up and been like, well, you know, this, this Jesus stuff is great, but I'm not wanted by those who love Jesus, and now what do I do? Um, but that, that passion that Saul already had for Christ was so strong that, that they went past that. Uh, but how discouraging would that be to walk in totally excited about these disciples that he was going to be able to, to hang out with, uh, these brothers in Christ, and then to get this absolute... Uh, situation, the, the awkwardness in that room, I could not imagine. You know, the elephant in that room has just completely sucked the air out of, out of that room. Uh, and what do you do? But how quick are we to be so fearful of people who Christ is working in and through? And to understand that I don't want my life in danger, and now you're telling me I have to accept this person? And even Ananias, a man of God, pretty much was arguing with Jesus, like, I don't want to go, you know, pray over Saul. Do you know what he's done? He, this guy's evil. I don't want to be around evil people. But Ananias was faithful and saw that, that Christ was doing a work in Saul's life. And they, those disciples in that moment didn't realize yet that Saul did belong in that situation, did belong with him because of what Jesus had done in his life. But it is so easy to judge. It is so easy to throw out the ideal of what I think a perfect Christian looks like, of what a, a good church member looks like, of what someone who I want to hang out with in my Christian faith. There's that ideal. But when people come along that Christ is doing a work in their life, Sometimes we throw some judgment towards them, and we, we don't want anything to do with them. I came across an article that, that was labeled, 10 Things a Church Needs to Stop Doing. And the one that was perfect for today was when we say, come just as you are, we need to be ready for who comes and not complain about who is showing up. Can you imagine that if we say, come as you are, um, which we want to do as a church, but then you have a drug addict come walking through the door. Very obvious. Uh, now he's given up his drugs, Christ is doing a work in his life, 
But it's obvious. Do we, do we want him in our Sunday school class? Do we want him, you know, to, to ask him out to lunch after church? Or you have a person that comes in with, with bad body odor, um, someone that just doesn't know how to, to keep themselves clean. Um, what do you do with an addict of podcasts, someone that listens to too much TVTopicTuesday.com? <laughs> they owe me lunch for that. Um, what do you do, and, and this is, what do you do when a homosexual couple walks through the doors with a kid in tow that they've adopted? What, what are you going to do with that? Are we ready to say, come as you are? Come no matter what the, the real in your life is. Um, so many times I think we as Christians have that ideal, and, and we, we need that ideal. We need the, the true theology of Christ and, and all of the things related to Scripture. But so many times we kind of compartmentalize ourselves. Ryan put it great in his testimony that I'd rather kind of hang out with the Christians that are good Christians and, and, and similar to me than, than deal with those who may not even know Christ or who have just accepted Christ and their life is not perfect yet. By the way, our lives aren't perfect yet either. What do we do with a guy covered in tattoos? And not just tattoos, demonic tattoos. Those things are gonna take a while to come off. But he is truly sold out for Christ Jesus. And he wants to come and be a part of our church. What are we, are we ready for that? Or are we gonna pull the disciples and say, no man, we, we don't want anything to do with you. And we are missing out and we are lacking faith in the work and saving power of Jesus Christ in the life of someone's heart. How in the world are we allowed to make that judgment? or judge anyone in that. And that's the irony, is that we're all in the same boat. It takes one sin to separate us from the love of God. It takes one sin to darken and completely distort our heart against the things of God. And yet, you know, we judge others because they have a lot more sins than I do. They're a lot worse off than I am. God can't possibly love them, you know, I, I don't I have a hard time understanding how much he loves me for all I've done. But we belong and they belong because of Jesus, because of his work on the cross. And taking a look at, at, at even the life of Jesus, throughout scripture you see all the people that Jesus came in contact with. His ideal situa- situation might have been just to hang out in the synagogue and temple. You know, those that that are at least pursuing the things of God, those would be a lot easier to deal with. But if you look throughout the life of Jesus, he went anywhere and everywhere. And one of my favorite is found in Luke 5, where Jesus is coming by a tax collector named Levi. And most people don't want anything, all people don't want anything to do with Levi. Jesus is like, you know what, come and follow me. And Levi drops everything and goes to follow him. And not only follows him, He's like, man, we're throwing a party. So Levi does this huge feast for Jesus, invites him. And by the way, Levi's circle of friends aren't Christians and believers. They're other tax collectors and sinners. Now Jesus is at this lavish feast for tax collectors and sinners. But because of what Christ did in Levi's heart, Levi knew that his friends needed to be at least exposed to the things of Christ. And here's Christ Jesus. Why would he not be there? And how awesome is that that he didn't just say, Levi, come follow me, get your life straight, you know, let's go on. Jesus is like, let's, I'm going to come hang out at your house. Uh, I'm going to invest time in you because I love you and because of what I'm doing in your heart. And how awesome is that, that, that Jesus invests in us, uh, that it's more than just, you know, do this and this and this, so that you're all right with me and then I'll see you in heaven. No, Jesus wants to be involved in the messiness of our life. Jesus wanted to be involved in the messiness of Levi's life. And here's what's cool about the rest of, or this next verse in chapter nine. Levi belonged because of Jesus. And there was someone else in that room with Saul that knew that he belonged because of Jesus and that was Barnabas. Uh, Look at verse 27. 
But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So here is now Saul standing in the doorway. The disciples are like, you don't belong here. And by the way, how did they even know that he was in a room with the big old logs in their own eyes? You know, how guilty are we of that sometimes? But Barnabas, Barnabas comes and says, look, I know more than aware of this fear that you feel. I know and am aware of this awkward meeting at this moment. I know that it would take time for you to, to build up trust uh, with Saul. But guess what? I know what Christ has done in Saul's life. And Saul, you know what? You come hang out with me. You come. We will do this together. We will walk through this situation together. How? I mean, Barnabas is a great guy anyway. Um, but to see that Christ was at work in Saul's life um, and gravitated to that and that faith that Saul had, or Barnabas had way outweighed the fear. That's a word, by the way, way outweighed. Write that down. Um, it was greater than the fear that, that others had because of what Christ was doing in Saul's life. And Barnabas, Barnabas just thought, you know what? You're one of us now. You were lost, and now you're found. You were blind, literally, and now you see uh, the amazing things of Christ Jesus. Barnabas knew that Saul belonged because of Jesus. And this is leading me and my thought to an experience that I know that is coming someday, where I will walk into the gates of heaven, I will look around at all the great saints, all the great uh, spiritual giants in my life, the people that I looked up to growing up in high school and, and college uh, and throughout my ministry of, of these great men and women of God, these great prayer warriors, uh, the great heroes of the Bible, and be like, I, I don't really deserve to be here. You know, compared to these guys, no way. And guess who walks up to me but Jesus? Says, Jesus, wanted, or Randy, why don't you come and sit with me? Let's hang out. Um, that's the saving power of Jesus Christ, uh, that no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, that the changing power of Christ and his blood covering our sins, him rising from the dead, conquering sin and death, that's an amazing picture. And here's Saul knowing this, and these disciples that, that were like, no, I don't want anything to do with you, but to, for Barnabas to see Yes, Christ is at work in your life. How awesome is that, that we have a relationship with Christ Jesus that no matter what we're going through, he is at work in our life. And who are we as a church, who are we as a people of God to judge anyone as they have accepted Christ as their Lord in their life, as that same blood that has covered our sins has covered the sins of this person? How are we to say, you're not worthy, you don't belong here, you're not one of our people. We are all God's people. We are all covered by this, the blood of Christ Jesus on our life. And as we come into situations, even this next week, and I, I hope and pray that there are people that you have already thought about that maybe you need to give a little bit more of your time to, maybe a little bit more of your attention to, knowing that Christ is at work in their life, regardless of their looks, their habits, their, their whatever, um, there is something going on amazing in their life. And who are we to say, you know what, I, I have my set of friends, I don't need any more. Uh, let me just you know, focus on the people that, that I like and that like the things that I like. You know, I'm not ready to get messy with your life but man, I'm sure glad Jesus got messy and his hands dirty in my life. Um, and graduates, you guys are about to take off to a place that most of you are gonna be surrounded by all new people, all new situations, all new living conditions, and you have an opportunity that you might feel like Saul, but I pray that you react like Barnabas, uh, that you look for opportunities to serve others uh, because of what Christ is doing in your life and seeking those who Christ is working at in their life. In church, I imagine as we 
truly open the doors to, to come just as you are, that we are ready to get our hands dirty and to, to get messy with people's lives. And, and there are people in my life who were part of, of my people and then they got real. There was a situation in life that happened or they were fighting a, a, an ongoing sin that they needed to confess. And sometimes it was like, wait, wait, hold on. You know, this is getting really real. You know, am I ready as a Christian believer to, to handle that situation? Um, and we need to know that we can be real with each other. We need to know that we can be honest with each other. There are some terrible things in my life that I, if I sat there and rattled off a list right now, most of you would be like, get off the stage. Um, <laughs> you don't deserve to be up there. We all have that. That's what sin is. There is nothing, nothing that, that makes a little white lie any, any better than someone that's persecuting the church. People, we are in the same boat. There are others that need to be in the same boat. That Christ is doing a work in their life and we need to be, keep them on our radar. We need to be that encourager like Barnabas was. We need to gravitate to each other, encourage one another, continue to build each other up in the things of God because Christ and his shed blood and his saving power is greater than anything that life will ever throw at us. And I pray as a church that we continue to, to love each other, to build each other up. Please look for ways uh, to serve others and to love on them as we continue to serve this awesome and powerful and mighty God. We're going to close right now with a time of prayer and then a closing song. And then we're going to pray again. And then I pray that we have some time to hang out uh, before we go off to lunch. But think on these things. Think on the, this amazing grace that is on our life, this amazing grace that is on others' life, lives that we continue to seek after him, not only in our own life, but in others, as we are the church. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together that we are blown away by this love and this grace on our life. Father, I pray that we continue to realize that you are at work in so many people's lives and that we, I pray that we are not quick to judge. I pray that we are not quick to throw up barriers and walls against those who you want us to serve and come alongside. Father, I pray for a stronger faith, knowing that your love is so much greater than any of our fear that we need to worry about. And Father, I pray that we continue to, to find ways uh, to love you more and to love others more as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.